Hey guys, this is module three, um, lesson 11, but it's actually technically Wednesday, even though this is Thursday's video coming up. I'm in my classroom to do this video because um, the listed items that I would need to do lesson 10 were not actually the things that I needed to do lesson 10. So when I grabbed my stuff on Tuesday afternoon to do Wednesday's lesson at home, I didn't grab the right stuff. So I'm trying to make up for that. So I'm in my classroom to finish up the parts of lesson 10 that I wasn't able to do from home yesterday. So bear with me while I try to get everything together to try to finish up yesterday's lab. And if you hear noises in the background, that'd be Jacob Krudlick, Eli Ward, and their parents kind of fussing at them. And Miss Smith's daughter, you won't hear a peep from her because she is sweet and quiet and running amongst these boys, trying to keep up, but you won't hear her. Jacob and Eli, they are rearing to go and happy as could be and helpful as could be because they've already helped me in my classroom get things set up for my students for tomorrow, which is great. Now, unfortunately, um, I've heard from multiple students, ones who messaged me, sorry, hold on just a minute. My husband's coming up here to help me. Um, I got to message him back. Um, while you guys were in the classroom working, by the time you're watching this is Thursday. So yesterday for you, today for me, because it's still Wednesday afternoon for me. Um, I was getting messages about students getting up and wandering around my classroom. I'm aware that there was an incident in my classroom Wednesday afternoon between some boys. If you were in your seat watching the video and copying things down, that would not have occurred. And you know very well that is not okay. This is the very thing I am not supposed to be worried about. This is why my doctor sent me home so I could relax to try to get rid of this migraine. Today is tw day 22 of this migraine and it's not my student's fault. It's my crazy brain's fault. But worrying about my students and my students doing things they're not supposed to do makes my migraine worse. The whole idea of me spending these days at home is so that I can get better and be back on Friday and be better for you little people. I've told you this before, and I hope every one of you guys know this. I love every one of you people. Okay, and I want to be my best for you. The part of my job that I love is my students. I need to be my best for my students. Part of that is you guys doing what you know you're supposed to do. Getting up and shoving each other, that's not being your best. Getting up and talking, that's not being your best. Sitting in your seat and talking, that's not being your best. Not doing your work, that's not being your best. Instead of Friday's quiz being an easy one that everybody should do just fine on, it's not gonna be. Okay, yep, you're having a quiz Friday and it's over the material that you have done Wednesday and Thursday. And I'm gonna make sure at least one or two questions have to do with things that are not written in your notebook, but they're things that you should have gotten from watching the videos, just paying attention. So if you've been up wandering my classroom and all you did was copy the stuff from the notes, then you've missed some of the stuff you're gonna get from the quiz. I need you to do what you're supposed to do. I do what I'm supposed to do for you little people. I need you, what you to do what you're supposed to do. I've already contacted one parent, I'm gonna contact some more because I'm not gonna have that happen. What happened today is not gonna happen tomorrow. Mr. Thomas will be my sub tomorrow. I only wish he could have been my sub today, which for you guys would have been yesterday. Cause like I said, you guys are watching this 
Thursday, even though I'm recording it Wednesday afternoon. Okay. I've got an hour and 10 minutes till the school shuts down. Mr. Vander will be coming in a few minutes to help me um, lift some things because there's some items that are very heavy that I'll be dealing with in a few minutes. Okay. I need you to do what you know you're supposed to do. You do not need me standing in front of you or sitting in here constantly telling you what you need to do. You already know. I love hearing my students correct each other because you guys know what you're supposed to do. And I shouldn't be spending critical minutes of my video reminding you of this. Now do what you're supposed to do. Be your best because I know how good every one of you are. Okay, now let's try to fix part of yesterday's lab that we weren't able to do because the curriculum writers did not tell me the right stuff to take home. Okay. All right, let me get to the right part of share screen. Ooh, wow. Wow, this is the worst the contrast has ever been on live image. We has terrible contrast. Come in, come in, Elmo. Okay, waves at the beach. So if you remember yesterday, uh, the paint pan did not fit in um, this bucket, obviously. Okay, I'm gonna zoom out. It did not fit in this bucket. It does, however, fit in this other bucket. Hopefully this cord will let me reach this over here so you can see where this is going. Okay. This is heavy. All right. So I got to get dupe book. We're all. Oh, don't let that fall in the water. Okay, so I still have my paddle. Okay, wave transfer energy. Waves at the beach. What I'm supposed to be showing is something like waves at the beach. They're just updating that there's tornadoes in our area. Okay. Wave tank in the beach, ocean floor is slanted. So this is supposed to represent the beach run up. Let me move this out of the way, the camera. Okay. Okay. So this area right here is shallower. Okay. This area is shallower. This area is deeper. Okay. Um, I put got very quiet. I'm guessing little boys were told to go to their classrooms. Their mom's classrooms, not their classrooms. All right, so let's put the boat in the shallower end and let's see if it moves up and down. These are these little short waves, short wave leap, short amplitude. You see the boat is moving up and down in the deep end, just like it would in deep water. I'm getting myself wet. By the time I go home, it's gonna look like peed on myself. Yay. And as Colby would tell me, I got the Titanic going. Okay, let's see if we can make it do the same thing in the shallow end. It is hard to make this thing stay in the shallow end without sinking my boat. <laughs> ah, that's why. I know you can't see it because of angle. I can see it very clearly. I keep throwing water right into the top of this boat, and that's why it's sinking. Titanic! <laughs> I might as well throw this sucker upside down because I'm just toppling water.
And indeed, it doesn't start moving up and down until it gets in the deeper water. Okay. It moves forward with the wave when it's in shallower water. No matter what Ms. Vanover does, she's sinking the boat. Well, watch when it's in shallower water. It moves forward. When it's in deep water, it doesn't keep moving forward. It's not all the way to the, the edge of the bin yet, but it stopped moving before it got there. And not just because I'm getting my own pants all wet. But look, it's not moving forward anymore now that it's in deeper water. So this would simulate what you see at the beach. Um, if only my cat had not ruined my pictures. So when we were in Costa Rica, um, I can remember this picture of this boat that I took off the shore in Costa Rica where the beach was like this, the boat was not, but the boat was out there where the water got deeper and it never seemed to go anywhere. It just stayed out there, out there where the water got deep. It never seemed to go anywhere. Despite the waves coming up, why didn't it go anywhere? Well, it's what we're seeing right here. It didn't go out to sea because of what we're seeing right here. It only goes so far out and then it stops going out. You see this? The waves, they're going that way but the boat is not. You see that, right? The boat's just kind of bobbing along where it gets deep. Okay. So water moves in the direction of the water near the beach. So the water's going this direction. Um, water waves at the beach. If I did this, that's what you see coming in at the beach. Man, I'm really getting myself wet now. If this box were created correctly, it would end right here. Okay, I'm gonna create this accurately. This box needs to be exactly the length of this paint pan. It's not. Okay. This is going to go up shallower, just like it would at the beach. Just like you, if you're bobbing along the beach, you keep getting pushed up to the shallower water. Right? I smell the chlorine in this because this is our water from school. And look, it's Titanic. I'm sinking the boat. Okay. So the slant of the ocean floor affects the way the water waves behave near the beach. Okay. It doesn't behave the same as without this pan. Because the pan created a slant. Now, let's see how it behaves now. Of course, I'm not doing well on making those short waves. I am effectively sinking the boat though. Yay for that. See, the boat's not going to the shallow end. It's sinking. I'm doing a great job sinking the boat. Okay. But it's not going to the shallow end like you would expect. See that? It's going in a circle. It's going in a great big circle. Now, as a reminder, drop this in and watch how it behaves differently. This is the deep end, the shallow end. Now, the fact that it's shallower over here, look how the boat goes over the other way. The fact that you have a shallow end means the boat moves differently. The slant of the beach floor, the slant here, affects the way the water waves behave near the beach. It very much affects it. OK? 
Okay. <sighs> Senior Vandiver will be here in a little bit to pour out all this water because it's just too heavy for me to carry. Already dragged it over here one way. Okay, now I'm going to pull over the poster while I have this set up here. Show you something else. told us earlier this year you have a great thing to dry great rack to dry stuff with. indeed i do okay uh -oh. all, right, all right so here was the updated poster you can see here is the water wave okay here's the boat if you have deep water Okay, it just bobs in place. It doesn't go anywhere. If you have a slant, in other words, shallower water, like at the beach, it's gonna go towards the shallower water. Okay, you see it moving towards the, the slanted beach line. So like we just saw at the boat, um, the slanted beach line, in other words, where it gets shallower, where you would be playing at the surf's edge, the boat or you go towards the slanted beach line where it gets shallower. That's what the boat's doing. It's going towards the shallower end where it's slanted. Okay. The waves direction is pushing it that way. The energy transfer is going that way. The paddle caused the disturbance. The paddle here, which created the wave. Okay. Wavelength is from the wave crest to wave crest. Amplitude is how tall the wave is. Okay. And here's the explanation over here that we've added. A wave is a regular pattern of motion caused by a disturbance. The paddle create, causes a disturbance and the wave travels away from it. The wavelength is the distance from one wave peak to the next. In deep water, waves transfer energy, but they do not transfer matter. That's why that boat doesn't move anywhere. It just kind of bobs up and down. This explains why an object moves up and down or side to side when waves pass, but it stays in about the same spot. The slanted ocean floor, just this, by the beach causes matter, i.e. the boat, or you to move in the direction of the wave. That's why you get pushed in towards the shore. That is the end of lesson 10. Now, let's start with lesson 11. And I have less than an hour to do all this. So hopefully I can do this in less than an hour. Wish me luck. Okay, launch. Okay, we talked at the end of yesterday's lesson about how elephants detect ground vibrations. With their feet, let me push this back a bit. They detect ground vibrations with their feet. And with their feet and with their trunks, trunks, okay? We humans have short trunks, our noses, trunks, all okay? right? Um, there's a question that I have to pose to you. The question, 
what sensory structures oh, I need a piece of paper ah, I'll use this one what sensory structures do you think elephants use to sense ground vibrations by a rainstorm. Okay, that's the question. I'm gonna zoom in. What sensory structures do you think elephants use to sense ground vibrations caused by a rainstorm? Okay, you've had some think time. You're gonna answer that right here. That's on page 25. Launch. You're gonna answer that question on top of page 25. Okay. What sensory structures do you think elephants use to sense ground vibrations caused by a rainstorm? Answer that question right here. You can answer it in a bulleted point. Or you can give it to me in a sentence. Okay. Focus on animals detecting vibrations with external structures that contain touch receptors. Okay. We've done some talking about this before. All right. The author of the elephant scientist, Dr. O'Connell, um, get to her first name, Caitlin O'Connell, also had a lot of questions she wanted to answer. And each answer she found led to more questions to explore. This is one way that scientists find answers. We're going to find answers to your questions in the same way. Ugh, I don't like it when they don't answer questions, when they don't number pages. Fancy footwork. Okay. While I read this, it's called fancy footwork. I want you to focus on something, okay? And again, you know the, the problems I've had with glare. Listen for ways elephants detect ground vibrations, okay? Fancy footwork. It was during Caitlin's visits to Etosha that she first noticed the elephants freezing like plant hoppers when listening for the arrival of other herds. When she saw the huge mammals stopping in their tracks and leaning forward on their front feet, she began to wonder if vibrations in the ground could hold important messages for elephants. Remember when we were reading about the plant hoppers? Why do they freeze in place? I'm gonna go back to page three. Says so he can focus and listen to the message. So he was listening to messages from other plant hoppers. So he could listen with his feet. Okay. And there's this little information right here. An elephant's foot has a fatty heel. I wonder what that means. What does that have to do with it? Look at all that texture on that elephant's leg. So much detail. Okay, so 
So here's a really cool um, x-ray. An elephant walks on his tiptoes with his weight forward, she explains, supporting each foot. And the weight of the elephant is a cushiony pad of dense fat at the heel. I wonder whether that cushion served more than one practical purpose. Caitlin knew that the pads in the elephant's foot contained a rich oil that people once used to harvest for their oil lamps. As she and her colleagues investigated further, using samples from a dead elephant, she found that the dense fat was similar to what other researchers called acoustic fat, sound associated fat in marine mammals. Acoustic fat helps animals such as dolphins send and receive sound vibrations in the water. This led Caitlin to think that acoustic like fat in the elephant's foot may help with the transmission of low frequency signals to and from the ground via the fatty foot pad. Perhaps the elephants were listening to sounds that traveled from their feet and toes to their ears. Here's an actual x-ray. Here's their foot. Here's, I mean, here's their leg. Here's their foot. So they're literally walking on their tiptoes and all of that is acoustic fat. So there's their tiptoes, okay? That's their tiptoes. And there's their toenail. That's their tiptoes, guys. All of this is fat. So if you look at this, here's their leg, here's their toe. That's their tiptoe right here. All of this, that's all acoustic fat. Acoustic means sound, okay? As a computerized tomography CT scan shows above, the elephant stands on its tiptoes and rests on a cushiony pad of fat at the heel. And then this right here says, Caitlin monitors the elephants, I'm gonna zoom out, from her field recording set, uh, station. The scientists first began recording elephant calls at Mushara to see if she could find an alarm call that could be used as an effective tool to keep the animals away from farmers' fields. So she's doing all this. Yeah, she's learning about elephants, but really it's a way to save the elephants' lives because elephants were trampling into farmers' fields and because of that, farmers would kill them. And you remember what I told you about um, elephants being endangered, okay? Um, African elephants, all African elephants are endangered. Uh, field elephants are endangered where they've lost crucial numbers, but forest elephants are critically endangered. They're about to go extinct. They're very close to being extinct. So she's trying to find ways to make people take notice and save these guys' lives. And by learning how these elephants communicate with one another, she can find ways to communicate back with these elephants and keep them out of farmer's fields. By keeping them out of farmer's fields, farmers wouldn't kill them. So she's saving their lives by learning about how elephants communicate. Okay, that's the whole point of this. Okay, an elephant family group flees in response to one of Caitlin's recorded alarm calls. So she's learning how to communicate with them. See, these are field elephants. Their tusks are straight. And these are males. They have tusks. He has a male there too. Um, she's learning how to communicate with them, which is crucial. You got to know how they communicate to communicate with them and to try to save their lives. In other words, how do you talk to an elephant? Look at this one. Majestic, yes. But this one, that's very aggressive. And that's what it says right here. An elephant matriarch, a female, gives Caitlin an aggressive head shake in response to an alarm call playback. Okay, so clearly, look at those eyes so intelligent. Clearly, she's been able to communicate with this elephant because she's made that elephant very mad 
and that elephant's warning her to get back. And she's not just warning Caitlin because she sees Caitlin. It's because Caitlin's been able to communicate with her using those recorded sounds from other elephants. Okay, so I'm gonna go back and pick up what we were reading. Perhaps the elephants were listening to sounds that traveled from their feet and their toes to their ears, Caitlin surmised. It's just surmise means to, to, um, to guess by educated guess. Okay, these low level vibrations. Do you remember when I played those sounds? Some of them were high pitched and I couldn't hear them, but you could. And then there were really low level sounds that we couldn't hear, but we learned that elephants can. And the elephants, sorry, allergies so bad. Might be raining outside, but I came in with lots of pollen on me. Um, elephants, uh, they, communicate using these really low level, less than 100 Hertz vibrations through the air, through the ground um, that we can't hear, but they can, and they communicate a lot that way. These low level vibrations in the ground might be byproducts of the elephant's booming voices and footfalls. So a footfall is that, okay? which were so forceful, they shook the earth. You can imagine a one ton or two ton elephant, it shakes the earth when it walks. As a result, their greetings, mating calls, and alarm signals might not only travel through the air as sound waves, but might also ripple through the ground. Okay, so let me back up just a little bit. When we talked about that foot cushion, that fatty foot cushion, that, that acoustic foot cushion, that fat, what might be another function of the cushion? Think. Let me give you a hint. I'm wearing a shoe. Now, it's not made of fat. Fat would start to stink after a while. But it is cushioning. Okay. These sketchers, this is at memory foam. Nice and cushioning. Do you think that might also be a, a purpose of the cushion for an elephant? I mean, it's not like the elephant's the size of a butterfly. They are kind of big. So do you think it could protect it from the fact that she's, she's a little bit big, she's a little bit heavy? The girls and guys, they might kind of need something to cushion their, their footfalls because they are, you know, big as elephants. Um, do you think also they could have some touch receptors in their feet? So we have touch receptors in our fingers, right? We have a lot of touch receptors. I'll tell you this thing right here, <laughs> where I had a blood stick and they had given me um, uh, blood thinners. So it kept bleeding for two days. It's got touch receptors. It's got deep touch receptors. And it's actually got a sore in it right now. So it's got an abscess, it's real deep. It's got deep touch receptors. It's got light touch receptors. It's got thermal touch receptors. So I can feel heat, I can feel cold. Do you think, and believe it or not, we have a little bit of fat in our hands too, okay? Do you think those fatty pads on the bottom of an elephant's feet could also be touch receptors? Just like we have touch receptors on our fingers? Don't we have touch receptors on our feet? Do you think the elephant's feet, all that fat cushiony pad, do you think that could also be touch receptors? Just like our feet, they feel things, right? I imagine an elephant's foot could feel things. I mean, I don't know if you could tickle an elephant's foot, but I know you can tickle my feet and I know you can certainly tickle Mila's feet. Um, We've talked about the elephant pushing forward on our feet. And we just saw, sorry about that. She's standing on her tiptoes there, right? Tiptoes. All this is fat. So when she's standing still on her feet, she's pushing her weight forward. Just like I'm doing on my fingers right now. I'm pushing my weight on my fingers. You can literally see my fingers turning pink and purple. Okay, that's like the plant hopper, right? So do you think 
she's sensing something when she's standing still like that. So do you think that's another purpose of the cushion on the feet to help them be able to withstand putting all that weight on their feet? I mean, I know women like the look of high heels, but I can't imagine an elephant standing on high heels. Now, that would be a pretty funny image. Maybe while I'm out of school tomorrow, I'll draw an elephant in a pair of high heels. I think this looks much better on elephant than a pair of high heels with some nude little toes, right? I think this looks much better for them to be standing on while they're standing on their tiptoes. This would be the equivalent of, I guess, wedge heels on a woman, right? Just take out that part and that's the equivalent of a wedge heel, right? Y'all understand what I'm talking about? I'm making any sense? Girls might understand it better than boys, maybe. Okay. So when we talked about acoustic fat, they kind of hinted at acoustic fat. Certain water mammals have an acoustic fat. Anybody heard of a beluga whale? Here, let me pull up an image of a beluga whale real quick. Um, share screen, post attendance. Beluga whale. Beluga whale. Baby beluga. Okay. Zoom meet. Zoom meet. Okay. This part right here on a beluga, that is acoustic fat. That allows a beluga whale to better hear other animals and other boats and us and other sounds like the train that's going by right now. It can better pick up the sounds in the water because that big ball of fat right there, that's acoustic fat in its head. Okay, that was one of those water, oops. <laughs> <laughs> I missed my husband's text that he was here. Someone let him in. Good thing. <laughs> um, that allows a beluga whale to hear other whales, to hear boats, to hear dolphins, to hear sharks, to hear fish, to hear all kinds of other sounds because of this, the beluga whale. And do you think that's like the elephant with the fat in its foot? Um, elephant foot DT. Okay, so here's another elephant foot. So here's his foot. Here's the little tiny bones. Underneath all this is that acoustic fat, just like this right here. All that is acoustic fat. Okay, so that. Do you think it so, serves the same purpose as that big ball of acoustic fat on the beluga whale's head? Okay, it's to hear things, it's to pick up those vibrations. I jokingly say my husband doesn't listen. Maybe he needs to learn to listen with his feet, right? Bryson, Mr. Peterson, not just listen with your head, but listen with your feet. Okay, so elephants are standing on their tiptoes. See right here? Here's where their toes are. This is that acoustic fat right there underneath that. So the purposes of this, I can think of several purposes. Do you think it's to help them pick up vibrations? Do you think it's to also help them distribute their weight because you know elephants are not exactly small little delicate butterflies when they walk They're kind of big sort of kind of big you know um so they need something to distribute that weight so they're not standing in high heels because an elephant in a pair of high heels might look a little funny um so distributing their weight to walk it picks up vibrations just like a beluga whale's big ball of fat on their head Okay, 
so they sense vibrations on the ground just like elephants sense vibration elephants just like dolphins or beluga whales pick up vibrations in the water um page 30 let me go back to some thing here stop share on this screen share on this craig i need you to go pour out this bucket of water right beside me this quote right here perhaps the elephants were listening to sounds that traveled from their feet and their toes to their ears this thing right here i had to push it across the floor it's kind of heavy so how are they listening with their feet how are they listening with their feet guys can we listen with our feet to the ground we wear shoes all the time blocks a lot of our listening with our feet but elephants are they listening with their feet with those acoustic pads in the bottom of their feet plant hoppers do it they lean on their feet right plant hoppers lean on their feet to listen with their feet maybe elephants are doing it too all right let's go to this part about vibrations do, 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 do. As a result, their greetings, talking about elephants, mating calls and alarm signals might not only travel through the ground, through the air as sound waves, but might also ripple through the ground. Caitlin grew excited about the possibilities. To begin testing her theory, she recorded various elephant calls while at Atosha. She not only wanted to know how the elephants communicated, but also hoped to identify an alarm call that would be an effective tool in keeping elephants away from farmers' fields. Up until then, she had been using loud noises such as car alarms to scare away the animals, but she knew it would only be a matter of time before they realized no real danger existed. I figured that in the long run, the elephant's own alarms would be the most meaningful to them. In other words, speak their language. At first, the elephant calls that Caitlin recorded all sounded the same to her, but after a while, she noticed subtle differences. Angry and excited calls, for example, varied more in pitched, in pitch from low, let me pick up a low sound. You guys already know I have these sounds in here. Ah, doggo, low sounds. Come on. From low sounds um, to high, <laughs> y'all appreciate this. I can't hear that, Craig can't hear that. I certainly can't hear that. And I don't know that you guys can either. Two high pitch sounds and back to low again. Let's go calls, which a leader used to summon a group to get moving, were flatter in tone. During one of her trips to Mashara Waterhole, Caitlin recorded several alarm calls that a group of elephants had made to alert others about lions in the area. The calls had a steep rise in pitch in the middle. So started off deep and went high, okay? The calls had a steep rise in pitch in the middle, much steeper than the other calls I'd recorded, she says. Caitlin made a special tape of these alarm calls and played it back on a boom box. Now, I know my students don't know what a boom box is. It's a big radio to different elephant herds in three regions of the park to see how they'd respond. I'd wait until the elephants had a chance to drink before playing the calls, she says. And I videotaped each trial. The researcher also noted the size and ages of the elephants in the group, along with any distinguishing features. Craig, um, is that dried out? Can you use some of the brown paper towels to dry it out and then put all those items back in it, please? Along with these, but it has to be dried out first because there's paper and stuff that goes in it, please. And we have to be out of here in 27 minutes. At Mushara Waterhole, the response to the recorded alarm calls was immediate. See her response? That's not a happy to see you response, is it? So that's an immediate response. The elephants ran off with their heads up and tails pointing straight behind them, says Caitlin, who played this tape 
to six different family groups. Now we've looked at pictures of family groups. They can be big. So all the elephants ran off with their heads up and tails pointing straight behind them. The intense reaction surprised Caitlin. Clearly she was onto something. Still, she decided to limit the number of experimental tri trials to as few as possible so as not to needlessly stress the elephants. She then reviewed the videotapes over and over to determine which calls produced the strongest responses. After identifying three deep rumbles in particular, she created a new tape and played it to the elephants. Okay, so let's go back a little bit. To this one quote, these low level vibrations in the ground might be byproducts of the elephants booming voices and footfalls, which were so forceful they shook the earth. As a result, their greetings, mating calls and alarm signals might not only travel through the air as sound waves, but might also ripple through the ground. Where do the vibrations in the ground come from? Are they coming from the elephant's footfalls? Just like when you guys are on the stairwell and you sound like a herd of elephants that I joke about, but actually elephants don't make that much noise. Do they also come from the elephant's booming voices? Kind of hard to think the elephants make a lot of noise, but they do. And the elephants, when they're trumpeting, all that trumpeting makes a lot of noise and it shakes the earth. <laughs> Lots of elephants doing that. It shakes the earth. What senses do elephants use to detect other elephants booming voices and other elephants footfalls? What senses? Is it just hearing or is it something else? What have we been listening about? What are they using? Is it just their hearing, guys? It's not just their hearing, is it? They're also using their feet to detect vibrations, aren't they? So they're using touch and hearing. And what do you think sensory receptors in the elephant's feet detect? They're detecting vibrations as energy transfers through the ground. They also detect vibrations made by other elephants and rainstorms. They're using their feet to detect rainstorms. So finally, we're coming back around to that big essential question. How do elephants sense rainstorms from more than 100 miles away? The one that's on my LED board, that's what I was looking at. Besides my husband over here. That goes in there too, yes sir, thank you. So they detect vibrations made by rainstorms and other elephants. And even my students on the stairwell, they would detect that probably from 100 miles away too. Because you guys know, you're loud. Okay, so let me finish this page too. Okay. Um, so Caitlin identified three deep rumbles in particular. She created a new tape and played it to the elephants. The instant fear response at Mushara told the scientist that these were the three rumbles that mattered. When she played the tape at two other sites at Atosha, however, the reactions were less dramatic. It was as if they didn't think the alarm calls were directed at them, said Caitlin. Some of the elephants even became aggressive and behaved as if they wanted to fight the caller, which in this case was me and my hidden boom box, her hidden radio. So boom box is a radio with the speakers kind of separated apart. So it sounds more realistic to whoever is listening to the sound, i.e. the elephants. Why did some elephants react fearfully to the alarm calls while others became angry? Was there more than one alarm call? that all, ele I'm sorry, was there one alarm that all elephants would respond to in the same way? And how were the elephants receiving these messages? 
Were they listening to the calls with their ears and their feet? I was filled with questions after the initial experiment, says Caitlin. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay. Um, so we got through all of that. So we looked at the wave model to represent water. Now let's think about it with ground vibrations. And here is our next question. And this is going to be the one you use to answer the, this paper. That's where you're going to put your answer to this one. Do forceful booming voices, such as my husband's, and footfalls, in other words, could he scare away an elephant, indicate vibrations with greater amplitude. Remember we talked about amplitude being those waves that are tall or vibrations with less amplitude. In other words, those shorter waves. And what I mean, greater amplitude, that's greater amplitude. This is lesser amplitude. Okay, can you see that? Come on, Elmo. That's big amplitude, that's little amplitude, but with less amplitude. Okay, and it says provide evidence to support your answer. Okay. You're not writing this question here. You're answering that question there. Okay. So do forceful booming voices and footfalls. I zoom out just a little bit, guys. I know it makes the, the contrast not as good. So bigger amplitude or smaller amplitude. Do forceful booming voices and footfalls indicate vibrations with greater amplitude or vibrations with less amplitude? Provide evidence to support your answer. Okay, now I've just read to you three pages out of the Elephant Scientist. So I've given you quite a bit of evidence and I've shown you pictures that I've pulled up online to try to give you more evidence. So you need to answer this question in your book on the bottom of page 25, okay? Okay. Um. 
it got us a little bit more to the video. So it says to update our anchor chart, which I added stuff to on Tuesday before I left school. This should be answered by now. If not, hit pause, get this answered, because this is what I'm grading on Friday. Notice today's is not copying anything. This is all your own work. Everybody should be giving me different answers. Okay, so updating the anchor chart. I've got to zoom this way out. Okay. So sense and response, sensory structures. Animals have sensory structures such as eyes, ears, nose to help them gather information about their environments. These sensory structures have smaller structures called sensory receptors. Different, rece different sensory receptors receive different information light, sound, taste, touch, odor, about the same environment and send it to the animal's brain. Now let's talk about waves. Waves form regular patterns described by their amplitude and wavelength. Waves moving across deep water move matter up and down or back and forth, but do not cause matter to move in the same direction as a wave. Waves transfer energy across a distance. Now back to animals. For an animal to sense vibrations in the ground, energy must travel from a source to an animal's sense receptors. All right. Then I had to update anchor chart. So I'm only putting block one's anchor chart, anchor model up here. I've updated all three of them. This is still elephant sent storms from 100 miles away. So what was added to it was vibrations in the ground, because we just read about vibrations in the ground. The energy transfers from the I've got the energy transfer from vibrations in the ground to the elephant in this in her her feet. This one doesn't have any touch. So her feet are receiving that energy transfer. See, she's sensing the vibrations. Okay. And this was added to all three posters. Okay. Feet senses vibrations, energy transfer, energy vibrations in the ground. Okay. Okay, I think we're almost done with the video, guys. All right, so how are ripples in water like vibrations on land? We talked about this before. How are ripples in water like vibrations on land? Don't ripples in water start off in the middle where they're strongest and they go outward in all directions? Isn't that like a vibration? Don't ripples in water involve an energy transfer? Doesn't vibrations on land involve an energy transfer? Don't ripples in water and vibrations on land both involve amplitude and wavelength? You can have low amplitude, short wavelength, high amplitude, short wavelength, Low amplitude, long wavelength, high amplitude, short wavelength. 
How can elephants detect information on a rainstorm? Isn't it energy being transferred from the storm to the ground? Energy is transferred across the distance through the ground to the elephant. I think that's important enough that we write this answer right here. Elephants can detect information about a rainstorm when energy is transferred from the storm to the ground. That energy is transferred across a distance through the ground to the elephant. You're welcome, because I have a feeling this is going to come up on a conceptual checkpoint later. How might elephants detect this information? And yes, you need to write that down in your notebook. It'd be nice if this came in. Earth to Elmo, Earth to Elmo. Elephants can detect info about a rainstorm when energy is transferred from the storm to the ground. That energy is transferred across a distance through the ground to the elephant. Elephants can detect information about a rainstorm when energy is transferred from the storm to the ground, that energy is transferred across the distance through the ground to the elephant. Yep, you need to write that. I believe that's probably gonna be the answer to a question later on. It's necessary that you write it. If you need to pause the video now. Okay. How might elephants detect this information? What are they using to detect it? What have we been talking about today? I have hands. I also have feet, but elephants are using their feet. What receptors are they using, guys? Where are the touch receptors they're using? In their feet. Okay. Oh, I need to add something to the picture. Yay, I'm not quite there yet. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I add something else up there? Okay, um, last two sentences on page 32. Let me go back to page 32. Was there one alarm that all elephants would respond to in the same way? And how were the elephants receiving these messages? Were they listening to the calls with their ears and with their feet? I was filled with questions after the initial experiments, says Caitlin. Dr. O'Connell still had questions about how elephants sensed the call of other elephants. 
think about how the questions to those answers might relate to how elephants sense distant rainstorms. What type of information can elephants detect from rainstorms in addition to vibrations in the ground? They're not only picking up vibrations in the ground, but what else can they get? What other kind of information can elephants receive? They're not just listening with their feet. How else are they listening, guys? How do you listen with your ears, I hope, so you can hear sounds? What questions do we still need to investigate, just like Dr. O'Connell? Do we know what all kinds of sounds elephants can hear with their ears? The book said sound waves. The sound move like a wave, like a water wave. How can we investigate how animals detect sounds? Couldn't we explore different sounds to see how sound works? Maybe we could find a way to see sound like we did when we use water waves to model ground vibrations. Our next phenomenon question is going to be how does sound work? Um, I need to add one more statement to the elephant picture and I'm going to do this once this starts converting because I've got five minutes till I'm supposed to be out of here. This is not going to be converted and uploaded to YouTube that fast. But that is energy is transferred from a rainstorm through the ground by waves. As energy moves through the ground, it causes vibrations that we think elephants can sense with their feet. Maybe these sensory structures have receptors that are specialized to sense rainstorms from more than 100 miles away. Okay, so that is it for our lesson. My picture isn't too bad compared to theirs, right? Craig, look, their picture, my picture, my elephant isn't too darn bad, is it? Trunk's not on the ground. Apparently trunk's supposed to be on the ground. I've got two of them with the trunk on the ground, one of them with the trunk up in his mouth. So that is it for Thursday's lesson, guys. See y'all. That's the end of lesson 11. Do what you're supposed to do on Thursday. Don't let me get more reports from multiple students about students not doing what they're supposed to do. Let me get good reports from Mr. Thomas on Thursday and from my students because you don't know who it is. It's letting me know what's going on or what teachers is letting me know what's going on either. See y'all. Bye.